All right. Thank you for joining everyone. Uh, my name is Jerseo Chiggs. I am a manager on the Rails infrastructure team at Shopify. And I'm here with Aaron Peterson and Rafael Franza. Uh, can you talk a little bit about yourselves? Maybe starting with Aaron. Yeah, sure. Um, my name's my name's Aaron Patterson. Uh, I'm also known on the internet as um, Tender Love is my handle. Uh, I've been working on Rails. Let's see. I've been working with Rails since maybe 2006 or so. Um, I'm not sure how long I've been on the core team. I think maybe um, maybe like eight years or so. But I'm on I'm on the core team too. Um, I work for Shopify, of course, <laughs> uh, on the Code Foundation team, and yeah, I, I don't know. That's that's about it. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, my name is Rafael Franza. Uh, I work with Rails since 2011, and I'm in the Rails core team since 2012. Uh, I work for Shopify for a little bit more than six years now. And it's like I've been working in many different things here at Shopify, mostly on the Ruby and Rails framework, but I also try very different. Like I started a few experiments, like for example, Sorbet type checking and other interesting stuff like Truffle Ruby as well. Nice, excellent, thank you. So folks on the audience, there's still time to ask questions. So please ask questions on the Shopify channel with the AMA Shopify tag, and we'll make sure to uh, answer as many as possible during this call. Um, so let's get started. Let me pick one of those here. Um, maybe we can add some more context on the question that was asked before about Truffle Ruby. So Lazy Atom asked, I understand you're investing in Truffle Ruby at the moment. Are you using it in production or is it purely R&D for now? Maybe Rafael can take on that. Yeah, sure. So we started the Truffle Ruby. I will call it experiment right now, but it's not really experiment. I experiment uh, two years ago almost, and our plan was to see if we could get Truffle Ruby running in a production application. We tried to strip down some requirements. For example, we knew that it could be, would be harder to make it work with. Rails applications be, because like we would have dependencies like local Geary and things that would like require some C extensions to compile. So we went with probably our biggest application in terms of traffic. That's how we start front rendering is like the application that handles and serves all the traffic when you see a Shopify store. So we started with that application. We could get Truffle Ruby Starting running the application, passing most of the tests, actually all the tests. And then we were able to deploy to production to get some performance or performance like measurements about like how was what's what was what was the behavior in production. And we saw very inter interesting numbers. Like for example, we saw that it was very hard to warm up the Truffle Ruby VM enough to make Truffle Ruby faster than C Ruby, and we of course were very cautious about like not serving the traffic photo for Ruby to our clients because it could be either like give bugs or have like a slower response time. So today I think we keep a cluster of Truffle Ruby machines getting the traffic, the production traffic for maybe 1% of the, the, the traffic, but not serving back to the users, just like getting the traffic, dumping performance numbers. And like we even used to compare if the result of the page is the same between Ruby implementations. This year we have the goal to actually run this in production for most of the traffic and actually serve to our users. But like, we need to figure out some improvements to Truffle Ruby, for example, decreasing the warm up time. So like we could get the VM warm up after less than one or two minutes. And also like improving the development experience because boot, booting a Truffle Ruby process is very expensive so far. Nice, thank you. It's it's good to, to know what 
Shopify is doing for Turfo Ruby this year. Uh, Aaron, do you have any thoughts or comments on that? Otherwise, we'll move to the next question. Uh, no, not particularly. I think I think Raphael covered most of it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. So, uh, how does the Ruby and the Rails teams work with the community? Uh, do we dedicate time to open source specifically? Uh, who wants to take that on? Yeah, I, I go ahead. Aaron. Well, all right. Yeah. Um, I guess. Uh, well, first off, I want to I want to show off my um, my soundboard. Hold on a sec. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so. With regard to with regard to Ruby and Rails, so Shopify um, pays me and other folks to work on open source open source projects full time. So we're mostly dedicated to uh, working on improving Ruby and improving Rails. As I mean, that's my full time job basically. And we have other other folks on the team that do the same thing. Um, I, is there anything more specific than that, or is it just like? I think the question was more about, okay, do we, you know, dedicate 20% of the time for some people or how does that work in general? I, I think it varies. It varies from teammate, team per, per, person to person. Maybe Raphael would probably know better than me, I think. I mean, like, we don't have strict rules. Uh, I think it depends on what we need from those contributions so like for example myself i i like to say that i spend a lot of time focused on shopify like for example what shopify needs from the open source community so that's how i spend my time right like seeing okay shopify need this feature now and i go and work on that feature for rails but there are times on in the year that i don't even look on anything shopify specific like Closer to our Rails release, I my focus is mostly on Rails, and I care about like working with people at Basecamp, GitHub, to actually get the features merged on Rails, like uh, make sure that everyone is aligning with the direction we want to take, like merging most of the PRs in the repository. I think the, I still one of the most active like person in the Rails issue tracker, even that I don't dedicate a lot of time on that but i have like people in my team for example that spend most of the time focus on shopify problems and for example when they need to fix some book they fix direct on ruby or in rails we don't have issue rules most like what we need to get out of that relationship with the community thank you that's that's great to hear um so speaking of contributing to open source do you hire people in the Rails team who don't have experience contributing to open source? Is that a hard requirement for hiring? Maybe Rafael can take this one. No, it's not a hard requirement. So we had some ways to like to get people on board in the team quickly. For example, in the past, I run a program inside Shopify called Obesos Sabbatical that we get people from other things at Shopify to work full-time in open source for three months. And that was a way for us to recruit to our team. And also to spread a little bit the knowledge about how to contribute to high-profile open source projects inside the company. So people don't feel that like, in order to then to get a feature in Rails, they need to ask our team. Like they totally can try themselves and try to contribute to the project. I keep an eye on, on a lot of the contributions that or contributors that I see in the community as well to help them to ramp up on, on open source contributions. But it's not a requirement for the team. It's most like we train inside the team people for that skill set. Nice, excellent. Uh, oh, we have a question here from Santiago. Do you have any plans to try Hotwire at Shopify? Uh, that's an interesting question. So we probably will try in some applications, but like most of our front-end code today is using React. 
it's like we are very invested on, on React and React Native. So I think it would be very hard for us to release a product, like part of our main product using Hotwire those days. But like maybe in a small product or a, a new internal application, we might try Hotwire. I personally, I'm very interested on that. Like I really love, I really love the assets pipeline from Rails 3 and 4. And I really miss that like easy to use experience. And I'm really excited that Hot Air is a thing now. Nice. Uh, so this could be a good segue actually to another question, which is um, we talk a lot about the Shopify big monolith and what we do there, but what about the smaller services that we have at Shopify? Like we have hundreds of Rails applications there. Is there anything special or different that we do with our usage of Rails in those projects? Anything that we can talk about? So I think like in the past, we had not much of control over like what people do in those other services. And like our team is, is being very focused on our biggest monolith. But in the past year or so, we have a team dedicated to think more broadly about all the, I think more than 200 services that we have today. And that team is now dedicated to work on like defining what are the best practices and what are the libraries that we should be including in every single service. So we have an internal generator for Rails application that already set up a lot of things that are specific for Shopify. For example, our CI pipeline, uh, Sorbe, that's our type checking tool. And what else? And other configurations that work for our infrastructure specifically. So what I can say is that most of our services try to follow the, the Rails default stack. It does not deviate a lot from the Rails default stack. That's actually a design decision that I try to push here inside Shopify. It's like shop, any Shopify application should look as any application outside of Shopify. That's is to make it easy to, to hire, make it easy to, to actually evolve the applications with time. So I think that's the special thing we do with our applications. We try to keep them as normal as any Rails application that you will generate today with Rails new. Perfect. Aaron, any thoughts or comments on that? Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of special stuff that we do. I, it's important to me that we keep that we keep things like as close to default as possible, not just for hiring, but also for upgrading as well. makes makes upgrading a lot easier. So, yeah, and that and that's a big deal. Like we we talk a little bit about how in our monolith we are using uh, edge rails, right? We update on a weekly basis, so it's really important for us to keep things as up to date as possible. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so there's another question here from StatZone3. Uh, can someone talk about how Shopify guides newer devs into specific focus? How do they assess interest, ensure fit, accelerate learning, et cetera? So I'm assuming this is about people who join the company and uh, yeah, how do we guide them towards a specific path? And we have two errands now to help with that. I guess I can answer a little bit on our team, but I don't know about the broader, like Shopify is a pretty big company, so I'm not sure about the entire like broader picture, but on our team, we like to do like, I don't know, we bring in, we bring in folks from other teams to help. Uh, we have hack weeks so that we can work with like, work with stuff that we think might be interesting or we might be interested in so we can try it out and see what it's like. Uh, our team specifically does a lot of pair programming so we can do like training in that to figure out like what do we like and how can we improve. Nice, excellent. And, and from a, a kind of hiring perspective, Rafael, do you have anything to add there? I was going to ask you as well, but like I, I can start. So, yeah, so in terms of like hiring perspective, uh, 
today our hiring pipeline is centralized. So what happens like you join the same like hiring pipeline as other folks and the interests are matched inside that the interview process, right? Like you could have interview with different teams and those teams are going to appeal more to you than other teams. And that's kind of like where the, the hiring funnel goes. But inside, like once you are inside Shopify, it's also very easy to, to do internal movements. So sometimes you join a team and you work there for a few months and you get tired of working on that part of the product and you, you want a different challenge. So you can like, it's easy to move from one team to another team. I think this year just did this, this movement. He was in different teams, he joined a team. Yep. And like, I cannot speak a lot about moving inside Shopify because I, I found that the team I am on right now is kind of shot with me and just, I still in the same team. But I had a lot of people coming from other teams to our team in, in the past six years. So internal movement Shopify is totally a possibility as well. Yeah, I would say it's even encouraged in a lot of cases. There is a lot of trying to match people's interests and skill sets to you know, whatever is true to them at the time. Like I've seen people moving from uh, mobile development to infrastructure, like Kubernetes stuff development. Uh, and I've seen a lot of internal movement in between areas or between projects, between teams. So there's, there's a lot of help and support. And there's even some encouragement if you're in the same team for a few years to try something new. Uh, another hiring question. Do you only hire senior developers or also intermediate? I've been using Ruby since, since 2010, but I only have three years of experience. Maybe you, Rafael? Yes, I, I think we just answered in the channel, but I can answer again. So right now our focus have been on senior developers, but I talk about focus. It doesn't mean that if you are not senior developer, we are not going to hire you. So there are open positions for junior developers. And like in the past, I would say that our focus was actually more junior developers. Like our team, for example, we have people that join the company as interns and like stay in the company until now as full-time employees. I actually had a, a very good example of someone that joined the team as an intern six years ago, and today is a, a staff developer. So right now, yes, we are hiring like junior developers in interns as well, but our focus have been more senior folks. Makes sense. Uh, question from Adam. Is Shopify along with the new JIT continuing work on the RTL project from uh, Vladimir Makarov, or is RTL unrelated or maybe discontinued? We'll who, take who that. Take that oh. Yeah, um, we're not, so we're not working on Vlad's JIT at all. We are developing our own uh, JIT for MRI and it's called YJIT and it's open source. It's on our, it's on our fork of Ruby. So if you go to GitHub slash Shopify slash Ruby, uh, you can find the branch there and check it out. And Please, we're we're taking contributions for it, so please check it out. <laughs> I, I just want to add that there, there was a talk from Maxim uh, from last month about why shit. So if you, I can share in the in the Shopify channel. But Thanks. if you're interested in learning more about this shit, you can take a look on, on that talk. Awesome, thank you. All right, uh, from Matthew. Does Shopify use a front-end framework like Angular, React, and if so, which one? I think we already mentioned this. Shopify invests a lot in React, and we use React for most of the front-end for at least the customer-facing applications, though that might differ a bit on um, internal applications for, for some cases. Um, there was a question yesterday about using Sorbet with Rails and Fook mentioned tapioca. Um, 
Are there any other tools or setups that we recommend people to use or anything that we are developing internally that might be interesting to share here? I think there are two tools, actually Tapioca and Spoon, both are open source already. I think Tapioca is more like our, our Swiss army uh, kit for like, for work with Sorbet. We don't even use the Sorbet in it helper. We always use Tapioca. I find that Tapioca is a good balance between static type and static analysis and dynamic generated methods because it's like use reflection to find like the classes and methods generated by libraries so you don't need to deal with metaprogramming anymore in your application. So apart from that, I think we are working with like some different experiments in tooling right now that like nothing uh, to open source yet, but like, for example, we are trying to improve the editor integration. Uh, we are trying to also find ways to decrease the performance like, drawn break that Sobe gives you in the production environment. So yeah, we are experimenting with those things, but nothing to to share yet. Nice, thank you. Aaron, anything to add there? Mm, no, I don't think so, no. Cool. Uh, is Shopify, uh, okay, yeah. Is Shopify using type checking with either Sorbet or RBS and how much is it using? So we are using Sorbet, but uh, do we have any numbers or general idea that we can give people about how much Sorbet we are using? Uh, we are using Sorbet mostly in our main monolith. It's like two millions of lines of Ruby code. And I think right now the numbers is like 80% of the application is being type checked already. Uh, that means that we, like, we check if the method calls is being called in the right objects. And like we are planning to increase this number to close to 85%. I think it's 86 right now. So probably we are winding down that work. Other applications are already starting to use Sorbet. And like I said in a question before, new applications generate already with Sorbet. So we are very invested in Sorbet and we are not using RBS, mostly because we want the advantage of a fast stat analysis checker. And RBS does not have anything close to Sorbet yet in terms of the speed we want to get out of a, a type checker. Gotcha, thank you. All right. Uh... Okay, there is a question from Santiago. When is the Upgrow guide going to be back online? I think it was a good resource, although it needs to be softer when criticizing other approaches. I can't talk about that. So the Upgrow guide is probably going to get online soon. I, I don't know the dates, but soon. The reason why we, we took the Upgrow guide from the internet is that like we like what was written there it, it was actually written for internal consumption so like people inside we wrote that as a project briefing like a, a way to to sell the project to the stakeholders and it assumes that you have most of the context why we are doing that so and we did not expect that once we open the repository, the source of the repository in the internet, people would already start to share. And like in the first day, someone already posted in the Reddit and I was a little bit worried, but not much because I said, oh, I don't think this is going to actually get in attention. But when it was shared in the Ruby Weekly newsletter is when we started to think of removing it because we knew that the context was missing. 
and people could be misinterpreting. Like in the first Reddit thread, I already saw a lot of uh, comments of people misinterpreting what we want to do with Upgrow. So just to explain a little bit what we, what's the context that's missing. So Upgrow is today seen as experiment site Shopify. We are using parts of the patterns that are, are being advertising that guide already in our applications, but they have different names, different shapes. We don't have anything that tells, okay, this is how uh, our latest application should look like. So Upgo is an experiment to actually try to get all those ideas together and build a comprehensive tool and library and EVA guide so people can actually uh, understand what we want to get at. So my personal belief is that I don't think that like everyone should start every single application using the patterns that I upgrade. Uh, that's was not our intent. And that is the context that was missing in that guide and that we are correcting right now so we can open source it again. Thank you. That's super useful context you have. Uh, so we are almost at the time. So I'm going to ask one last question. Uh, folks, any questions that we couldn't answer yet? Uh, we'll be answering them throughout the conference. So feel free to keep asking questions on the Shopify channel. So maybe this is a good one to end things in. Are there any bets that Shopify is making over the next year? Uh, are there anything that we haven't talked about that we are working on that would be interesting to share with the community? Raphael? Um, I, I, can, I can start, but maybe Errol can you start this one. Sure. I mean, I don't, I'm trying to think of bets that we haven't mentioned so far. But I, we, we talked a little bit about YGID and a bit about Truffle Ruby, and I think those are probably our biggest bets right now. Um, yeah, I like. I think those are those are our biggest bets for the next year with regard with regard to Ruby. I, I was going to say that the bet we are making is on Ruby. Like, we yes. are betting on Ruby for sure. Like, that's the language of choice of Shopify. That's what we like to work on. That's what we are investing. And like, there are many things that I'm excited about uh, the future of Ruby. Like Aaron mentioned, we had we are working in Ajit. We are working with like type checkers, sorbet, and like we are part of the types types work group with the Ruby core. And like we, we are betting on Rails as well. Like we have three, four Rails committers right now in, in the team, in, in the company. A lot of people contributing to Rails. Yeah, I, I think that's the bet we are making. Like Ruby is our bet. It's a, it seems like a like a really easy sell at RailsConf. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, yes. <laughs> and, nice. Uh, and I glad I glad it's easy to sell at RailsConf. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. I think this is the perfect way to end this uh, AMA. Uh, so, like I said, please feel free to ask more questions on the channel. We'll be there answering them throughout the conference. And uh, thanks for everyone who joined and asked questions. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.